it takes quite a bit of courage to go back home. At 9 o'clock, just about an hour ago, we gathered our families, many of our families, in the courtyard for our monthly outdoor worship that's more geared for those with more wiggles than the, uh, than the, the cathedral will usually accommodate. It's called Church of the Commons. And this morning, since it's the 4th of July, Canon Sharissa Simmons, our canon for children and families, told us the story of Harriet Tubman, that great American hero, the great American Moses, a woman who escaped from slavery only to then return home over and over again, putting herself back in harm's way hundreds of, well, many, dozens of times in order to rescue her people from their bondage. She escaped the worst kind of enslavement imaginable, and still she was called over and over again to keep going home, keep going home, which must have been about the hardest thing that Harriet Tubman, one of the hardest things that Harriet Tubman had to do. Jesus said, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and in their home country. He knows how hard it is to go back home. That saying has become kind of a, a popular aphorism. It's quoted and misquoted, but it captures a truth that the great prophets, prophets of this tradition knew well. Jesus knew this. Ezekiel knows this. He's sitting by the, the river Kabar in Babylon. He's among the captives who have been taken out of their hometown. And God calls Ezekiel too, right? Go back home. God says, I am sending you back to the nation of Israel, a nation of rebels, a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. Their ancestors transgressed against me, and now their descendants are impudent and stubborn. A nation of rebels. How do you all like that one for the 4th of July? I think that our, uh, our Anglican si siblings across the pond in Great Britain are probably smirking. They're hearing the same readings this morning, and I can imagine my British friends kind of smiling as they think about American Episcopalians celebrating our independence from Great Britain and hearing Ezekiel's excoriating words about a nation of rebels. Ezekiel, like Jesus, like Harriet Tubman, is being sent back home, which is not an easy assignment. He, Ezekiel's being sent back home to preach, which is maybe one of the most daunting things that a prophet can can take up. And God warns him, right? Fair warning, dude, you are not going to receive a fair hearing. They will not listen to you, God says. But even if they refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, even then, God says, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. So maybe you can imagine it. I imagine it was the 4th of July, not unlike this one. A big, beautiful, sunny 4th of July. This was 75, 76 years into the American experiment. It's a beautiful day, probably a hot and muggy day in Rochester, New York, Corinthian Hall. Banners and pennants wave exultingly on the breeze. The ear-piercing fife and the stirring drum unite their accents with the ascending peal of a thousand church bells. Prayers are made, hymns are sung, and sermons are preached in honor of this day, while the quick martial tramp of a great and multitudinous nation, echoed back by all the hills, valleys, and mountains of a vast continent, bespeak the occasion, one of thrilling and universal interest, a nation's jubilee. That's Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was the most photographed man in the 19th century. Can you believe that? More photographs of this guy than Abraham Lincoln. Born into slavery like Harriet Tubman, a prophet mighty in word and deed, lionized and laureled by some, even as he continually navigated, as St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. Douglass asked those nice white people gathered in Rochester, New York on that day, what to the slave is your 4th of July? This is 1852. What have I, he said, what have I or those I represent, what have we to do with your national independence. I am not included within the pale of your great anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. This 4th of July, he said, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn, he said. That's the voice of a prophet, a prophet who is not without honor except in his home country. You may rejoice, I must mourn. Whether they hear or refuse to hear, God said to Ezekiel, they shall know there has been a prophet among them. And I expect there were a lot of people that day who did not like what Frederick Douglass had to say, and yet they knew there had been a prophet among them.
If it's been a little while since you read his, it's actually a, it's a 5th of July speech that Frederick Douglass gave in Rochester, New York in 1852. If you haven't read that speech in a while, I encourage you to find it maybe this afternoon or this evening in lieu of whatever rocket's red glare we may not be entitled to this year. Uh, maybe we're in need of fireworks of a different kind. And these are bracing and inflammatory words that I think hold up 170 odd years after they were first preached. The existence of slavery, Douglass said, in this country brands your republicanism a sham your humanity a base pretense, and your Christianity a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad, it corrupts your politicians at home, it saps the foundations of religion, it makes your name a hissing and a byword to the mocking earth. That's biblical rhetoric. What Douglas names as slavery, legally overturned a century and a half ago, we are now learning to call by some different names white supremacy, Christian nationalism. This is the story that thousands of my fellow citizens are right now trying to remove from America's schools, the realities of our history and our present that are being litigated in our courts. Call it critical race theory, if you must. Call it white privilege, call it inequality, the stubborn gulf that exists between those of us with light skins in this country and everybody else. The distance that Douglas identified between those who rejoiced and those who mourned in 1852, that difference lives with us still. This last year has taught us that in no uncertain terms. No longer can we say, as maybe we once did, all of that is in the past. I am not responsible for my ancestors' actions. Just look at how much progress we have made. The legacy of inequality that we have inherited, in Douglas's words, fetters our progress. It is the enemy of improvement. It fosters pride. It is a curse on the earth that supports it. And yet he said to those good white people in Rochester, and yet, he said, you cling to it. You cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. The sheet anchor of your hopes. I love that phrase. A sheet anchor, for those of you who don't know, and I'm not, as you all know, not great on my nautical terms, but as I understand it, a sheet anchor is the anchor that you keep in the bottom of the boat in case of emergency, right? It's like the, it's the thing that is providing you ballast. It's your reptilian brain, if you like. The stuff that lies so deep in, so deep down in you. The stuff that you don't even, the stuff you don't even know that you know. The scripts that you don't even know you've been taught to follow until they pop out in a moment of anger or frustration or, or defensiveness, right? I mean, I've experienced this. Maybe you have too. Just witness the, the vitriol that's exhibited by white Christians as soon as you start throwing out ideas like privilege or diversity and equity training, even just telling a different story about our nation's founding, the, the inhumanity that was knit into the bones of our founding documents. Some of us are clinging to that old narrative, that triumphalist narrative, the accrued privilege and wealth and power of centuries of violence. That is the sheet anchor of our great white hopes. I remember so clearly when Ruby Sales, Ruby Sales is the uh, a, a godmother, a grandmother of the civil rights movement. She marked with, marched with Dr. King. She was on the front lines of this thing. And she called me up on the phone last summer to talk about the Black Lives Matter protests that were hitting the national news um, here in Portland. And we talked about it for quite some time. And Ruby Sales said, you know, Nathan, what you have to understand is that white supremacy does damage to white people. You all are suffering under this thing. It's a bunch of lies that you all were taught about who you are. And until, she said, until you start undoing those lies for yourselves, as much as for the rest of us, she said, th those of us who aren't white, like we've got, we, you know, like that's a different project. But she said, until you all start undoing the centuries of spiritual damage that have been done to you in the name of whiteness, you are caught in it. Until white people wake up to the damage that your privilege has done to you, you can never be free. And freedom is, I mean, that's what, <laughs> that's what this day is about, isn't it? Isn't that the principle upon which our nation so imperfectly was founded some 250 years ago? When you've been taught in a thousand tiny ways to anchor the sheet anchor of your hope to the power and the privilege accrued by skin color or gender or sexual orientation, you name it. I mean, that is when we are caught. So we engage the work of anti-racism in this community, not actually in the first instance out of a sense of noblesse oblige, right? This is not the right thing to do. This is not a do-gooder's desire to make a difference, a crusading you know, sense of justice for somebody else. If that's where this project starts for us, then I am lured once again into this trap 
that the power rests with me and that if I somehow engage the problems of society on my terms, I can quote unquote solve racism without actually having to change. And that is a lie. I cannot do it unless I am willing to be changed. So when I begin from a place of spiritual humility, which I think is what Jesus is always talking about, what all of the great prophets of our tradition are talking about, when they say, right, these words that we hear over and over, repent and return, repent and return, turn from your wicked ways and be ye saved. When I hear that voice, I think I can, I can gently begin to detach my hopes from the steer anchor of power and the steer anchor of privilege, the steer anchor of being white in a world that is head over heels in love with whiteness. When I experience racism, both personal and structural, as a dynamic that touches me too, as a white person, as somebody with power, something that has done damage to me and that has robbed me, actually, of the fuller humanity that my Savior has promised me, then I can begin imagining what real freedom might actually look like. And not just for me, but for every single one of my human siblings. That's spiritual work, right? That starts by heeding the voice of the prophet in my midst. It begins where every prophet begins. It begins with repentance and turning, being willing to change. It starts with repentance. It ends in hope. That's where Douglas ends his great excoriation of the American slave system. And in 1852, a decade before the Civil War began, there was precious little hope for Frederick Douglass and those abolitionists gathered in Rochester that day. The Compromise of 1850, the, the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, all of this combined to create a political climate where the abolition of slavery seemed like an impossible dream. And so much of the work that Douglas and his fellow abolitionists were doing in 1852 was illegal, right? They were bringing people up from the South, they were trying to get them into Canada, and they knew they could be arrested at any moment. There was not a lot of reason to be hopeful on that July day in Rochester. And yet, Frederick Douglass, born into slavery, found hope, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of our nation, he said, I do not despair of this country. He references the Declaration of Independence. These great ringing lines that were penned by an American slaveholder. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of those ends. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and their happiness. My friends, we are not powerless. We are not powerless against the forces of inequality and violence to which we have become accustomed. We are not powerless against these lies that we were taught. We are not powerless against the voices of defensiveness and hatred and fear that call for this different way of thinking and acting to be banned from our schools, abolished from our governments, who would enshrine one story of 1776 in our history books and erase every other American narrative, every other American prophet who has called this nation into a deeper and more searching reckoning with our power and our privilege. We are not powerless. We're a people. We're a people. And more than that, in this room, Many of us are Christians, and that means that we follow a higher call than Thomas Jefferson. We engage this work, we commit to this work as a community, not because we're progressive Portland liberals. Many of us would not claim that identity, I think. We commit to this work because we believe that our faith compels us to start telling the truth about who we are and what idols we were taught to worship to leave those idols behind and to begin imagining a different kind of freedom. It's not the freedom of a 4th of July parade with bunting and a Sousa march and a fireworks show, although God help me, I love a Sousa march and if you find me a 4th of July parade with floats, I will happily sign up. That is what I want today. But there's a deeper call, I think, 
amid all of the pomp and circumstance of a day like the 4th of July. This is a different kind of freedom on offer for us. It's the great freedom of the Hebrew prophets. It's the freedom of Jesus Christ. The freedom to be unshackled from the sheet anchor of my false hope and to set my sights on a different horizon, a different land, distant land that calls us forward, this truer place called liberty.